This is the Rational Reminder Podcast, a weekly reality check on sensible investing and financial decision-making from two Canadians. We're hosted by me, Benjamin Felix, and Cameron Passmore, Portfolio Managers at PWL Capital. Welcome to episode 244, and this week we welcome a spectacular guest and a super nice guy, the well-known Charles Ellis, very well-known and respected investment consultant, author, He has been one of the longest and most active proponents of index investing and articulate on that as well, and is the author of perhaps his most famous book, Winning the Loser's Game. He's also the founder of Greenwich Associates, which is a strategy firm focused on financial institutions. I was thinking about his book. So other than Larry Swedder, which is probably the author I've read the most, I think Charlie is next. Like I've read for sure four of his books, which I loved every one of them. And they're all very different because he writes about the investment industry as well as about quality businesses. Love his material. Great conversation, Ben. Yeah, great conversation. Winning, winning the Losers game is a, it it's belongs on the shelf of sort of classic investing yeah. books that everybody should read as a, as an investor. In In going through it, Again, I'd, I'd read it previously, but in going through it again recently to prepare for this conversation, I was I was struck by uh, it's it's not a super long discussion in the book, but there's a discussion of the difference between uh, pr- price discovery, which is like efficient markets, uh, efficient capital markets, and security pricing, and value discovery, uh, which is the idea of discovering for you as an individual or for you as an institution what you're really investing for. Um, what, what is your motivation? What is the outcome that the ultimate outcome that you want? Not, not the rate of return, but what do you, what are you really investing for? Yeah. And I found that discussion cause he wrote this book a long time ago, uh, in, in its first edition, I found that discussion given that context of how long ago this was written to be, to be profound, because this is something that, that we've just recently tried to <laughs> tried to start thinking about and focusing on is sort of that idea of helping people live good lives as opposed to just earn a higher return. Anyway, this is something that Charlie's been thinking about for for a very long time. Very long time. So Charlie's been on the faculty of both Harvard and Yale, and for nine years he was the chair of Yale's investment committee, alongside legendary David Swenson. Like, it's incredible. Can you imagine? It's incredible. That's incredible. He's also the author of the recently released an excellent book, Inside Vanguard, Leadership Secrets from the Company that Continues to Rewrite the Rules of the Investment Business. And also the book, Figuring It Out, 60 Years of Answering Investors' Most Important Questions. I got introduced to Charlie by Robin Wigglesworth. So thanks to Robin for the kind intro. So when I reached out to Charlie, he suggested that I read his book, his recently released book, What It Takes, Seven Secrets of Success from the World's Greatest Professional Firms. And I must say, for anyone who's in that kind of environment, it is an excellent book. And it just shows like his determination to learn and to right is unreal. He's 85 years old and he is just as driven, I think, as ever. So what, what can you say? Charlie's a legend. This was an incredible conversation. He's a great communicator. Make sure you stick around to the end. We have an outtake after we thanked him where we talked about luck. So stay stay tuned to, to the very end. Anything to add, All right. No, that's great. Let's go ahead to the episode. All right. Here's our conversation with Charlie Ellis. Charlie Ellis, it's a real privilege to welcome you to the Rational Minder podcast. I'm delighted to be with you, and I hope it's fun from your point of view and for your participants. Well, Ben and I have been reading your material for years, so this is a real thrill for us. So let's kick it off. Your most well-known book is Winning the Loser's Game. What is a loser's game? A loser's game is any activity that's a competitive activity where the outcome is not controlled by the winner, but it's actually controlled by the loser. Golf is a good example. People that are really good at golf will shoot less than par by two or three strokes on a regular basis. A lot of other people are proud to be able to shoot 90. There are some people who've never broken 100. Well, the difference between the two groups is the mistakes that the people who've never broken 100 make and make all the time. They don't swing quite correctly. They don't keep their eye on the ball quite correctly. They don't follow through quite correctly. And they hit the ball sometimes in the damnedest places. So another loser's game is tennis. 
And I got onto this as a very lucky break by reading a book about how you could play your best tennis all the time by a wonderful, brilliant American leader, Simon Ramo, who was probably should have been most famous because what he did for NASA, he was at TRW, Thompson Ramo Wooldridge, <clears throat> really designed most of the efforts that went into NASA <clears throat> during the critical years. He also happened to be a gifted musician and he and three members of the Los Angeles Symphony Orchestra played in public quartets on a regular basis. And he happened to be a really good athlete and his favorite game was tennis. And so he wrote this little book, uh, How to Play Your Best Tennis All the Time. And it's a marvelous example of a rational person approaching a game like tennis. And he's explained, uh, if you hit the ball back on a regular basis, let the other person have every opportunity to make mistakes. And if you look at your game and my game, or at least my game, how many times do you win a stroke instead of hitting it in the net, hitting it out of bounds, laying it up so easily for the other person to hit it back that you've essentially forced yourself into a loss? And if you could cut back on the number of mistakes and let the other guy increase the number of mistakes he made, you'll come out the winner of a loser's game. And then if you think just for a minute, that's what investing is all about. Most of the activity that most of us spend our time engaged in, in investing, actually doesn't help. It actually does harm. And our long-term results are impoverished by the, the mistakes that we've made along the way. Not doing some things and actually doing some other things. Trading too much, trying to time the market, things of that nature do have operating costs. And those costs accumulate, accumulate, accumulate. So the concept that I borrowed for the book is minimize your mistakes, keep the ball in play, and let the other guy make mistakes. You come out as a winner. And in investment management, if you could just reduce the number of mistakes you've made, you would come out as a winner. And the easy summary of all of that is if you index, you won't be making many mistakes. You have to choose the right index. That's fair. But if you index, you won't be timing the market. You won't be trading too much. You won't get excited about something you just heard from a friend of yours. You heard from a friend of his that looks like it might be a really great idea. And that's where we all of us, all of us make mistakes. Plus, index funds are super low cost and they don't have any of the operating expenses that active management have. And they don't have the taxes that active management has. So there are a lot of different little bits and pieces of advantage here. They're in another place that in adding it all up turn out to be over a long period of time. Huge. You, you talked about golf and tennis. Can, can you explain why money management is a loser's game? Sure. If you look at what you have done as an investment manager and compare it to what would have been done if you were indexing instead, you will see that you come out with a lower rate of return almost all the time. And it's because of the things you were doing, trying to win, trying to be better, that actually didn't pay off. Mm -hmm. You wrote about the loser's game in 1975 in the Financial Analyst Journal. How has the perception of active management changed since then? Well, at the time, of the original article, most people thought, oh, that's a kind of a cute idea. Of course, it doesn't apply to me. I have, I can beat the market anytime I want to. And if they look back over their shoulder at the prior 20 years, that was a wonderful time for active investment management. Uh, but world change, world change, the world change, and the world change in many, many, many different ways. And so it was just at the time when, in my view, active management was losing its moxie and was causing more trouble than was doing good. And since then, it's gotten harder and harder and harder to be an active manager and successful at the same time. And more and more people have accepted indexing as a perfectly rational way of taking advantage of the realities of the market and not getting suckered into doing things that actually do you harm. But it does take a sense of humor and it does take uh, an appreciation for history 
to realize, yep, yeah, I know you're wonderful. I know you're terrifically talented. I know you work very, very hard, but you're actually not helping wow. yourself or your clients. Wow. Can you talk you more about the how data? To... Let me let me just drop what to me is an absolute bombshell. If you look at the investment results of active managers, mutual funds being the only really good source of information, but take all actively managed mutual funds in a 20 year time period, 85 to 90 percent of them will fall short of the index that they chose as their index to be. So you're a large cap value manager. I'm a small cap growth manager, whatever type of manager we want to be. We choose, then we design how we're going to be really good at that. We choose the source of information that will be most helpful to us. We develop the trading skills that will be most effective. Then we go out there in the world free to do anything that we really want to do to advance our cause. And 85 to 90 percent of us will fall short. And at the end of 20 years, if you said, oh, gee, all we have to do is find the really good guys and we'll be in great shape. Sorry. Of those that happen to do well, about 85 or 90 percent of them will fail in the next 20 years. Right. You talked about how the market changed up up to the point where you wrote your 1975 paper. How has it changed since then? Oh, boy. Count the ways. It's just astonishing when you go back and look at it. If in the days gone by, we all were terribly proud that we had slide rules. I had a log log desk trick. It was an amazingly good slide rule. We None of us had computing power. The amount of information that was available was really limited because most of the major securities firms did not do research and certainly didn't distribute it generally. Goldman Sachs had just started. One salesperson had just started putting out a four-page flyer once a month. Uh, Merrill Lynch had no research of any kind as a matter of mm. principle, business purpose. Uh, it was really, really quite different than we're used to now. And the positive side for investors was really quite marvelous. Companies were so interested in being sure that their stock was fairly priced that you would be able to have private meetings for an hour, hour and a half, two hours, not just with the chief executive officer or the chief financial officer, but with several different division managers. And you could do that every couple of months. And they really appreciated that you knew a lot and they would help you by filling in any information you didn't know for sure. And so you could develop for yourself if you were willing to do the work, an enormous competitive advantage. And then if you look at the who was the competition, and I think most of us way underestimate this change. If you go back to the late 60s, early 70s, in and around that period, if you looked at trading on the New York Stock Exchange, the volume would have been between three and four million shares. Today, it's a thousand times larger or 2000 times larger in terms of volume. Yeah. So volume is really a big change maker. But the composition of the trading volume is an even bigger change maker. If you look back in the 60s, for an example, nay plus percent of trading was done by individuals who bought or sold every year or two or three. And half of what they did when they bought or sold was in transactions in AT&T because it was the most widely known company and it had nice dividend and it was quite safe. So that's 90% of your competition. And they're all amateurs yeah. and they have no access to any information. And they're just doing what they think might be a sensible thing to be doing. But uh, phrases like taking candy from babies come to mind right away. It was really not fair competition. If mm -hmm. you had the privilege of talking to management and really getting an understanding. In those days, mm -hmm. to beat the market was not hard. It was fun. And you could pretty reasonably expect to add 200 maybe 300 basis points a year on average over time because you had a terrific competitive advantage. Hmm. Since then, 
virtually everything has changed, and it's changed to make it tougher and tougher and tougher. Uh, if you believe, as I do, the Darwinian concept of the, there's always this con continuous competition, and the best will be prevailing. If you look at investment management today, the talented people in investment management are superb. Hmm. They are wonderful. They're smart as the Dickens. They've all got graduate degrees. They've all got organizations that work all the time, and they have access to a tremendous amount of factual information. And they work using computers and other ways, constantly trying to get small comparative advantages. And if you took it, act, talk to active managers today about how did you do your research on that particular company, you'd have to stand back and be really impressed. This amount of rigor and the study care and the attention is just, just amazing mm -hmm. uh, and much to be admired. One problem, and boy, is that a big problem. Everybody who is in active management is really terrific. Everybody who's in active management works all the time. Everybody who's in active management is really skilled at the work because all the other people have been driven out of the business. And then you look and you say, well, what has changed? And then you get, it's just <laughs> one after another after another. You start with, how about change in information? Well, back in the 60s, there might have been as many as 5,000 people worldwide involved in active investing. More than half of them would have been in the U.S. The next largest group would have been in the U.K. And then there have been sprinkled of people, some in Hong Kong, some elsewhere, trying to figure out what they could do to get a comparative advantage. Well, today, that 5,000 has been increased to something like 2 million. Hmm. So 2 million people does transform the nature of the market. And then you think, okay, so participants are really good. And uh, yeah, they also, terrific educations. You have MBAs all over the place today. That was a very rare thing years ago. You have PhDs, you have MD PhDs. You have people who've got all kinds of skills and they're in there competing all the time. So the intellectual level has been raised and raised and raised. And then you think, well, what kind of equipment do they have? We have slide rules. What do you guys have? Well, we have more computing power in our pocket than an IBM 360, which you guys were all excited about back in the 1960s. We all have computing power more powerful. And we have internet, which gives us continuous access to all the information we ever want anywhere. And we've got Mike Bloomberg's wonderful terminals, and yeah. we can manipulate and do any kind of analysis we want to do anytime we want to do. And most of us have one at home and one at work. And then some people have one in the limousine taking them between home and work because they don't want to miss anything. But just imagine what an extraordinary cut calling and flow of information that produces for everybody. So it, it's just astonishing reality of change. But the trouble is everybody's got a Bloomberg terminals. Everybody's got internet access. Everybody's got terrific computing power. And everybody's part of this fabulous worldwide network of information from all the major securities firms with branches in all the major economies around the world, piling information into the system and making it available to everybody who wants to compete. So it's a, it's a very highly competitive thing. And it's doing what an economist would say, but that's what markets are for. That's what markets are for. So do you think the sentiment toward active management has perhaps become a bit too negative? Well, it depends who you are. Uh, if you look at my own views, you'd say, gee, Charlie, you're pretty negative about active management. Uh, if you looked at how many people are in active management, you'd have to say it gets larger and larger every year. Um, if you look at the number of people who are studying for the CFA program or for an MBA in investment management, that gets larger and larger every year. If you look at the number of clients, it seems to be going up fairly steadily. If you look at the amount of money, you'd say it's flowing towards indexing at a pretty substantial clip, but that's very substantial clip in terms of money doesn't really affect how many people are involved quite so much as many as, it's not as obviously connected as 
number of people, it's a substantial institutional flows uh, have been part of it. And uh, people who go into indexing often do something else as well in the active area. So they don't go entirely into indexing. So I think there's a lot of room yet for people to decide, you know, hmm. the evidence is awfully powerful. And I know that I'm better than anybody else, but I'm just not going to waste my time trying to prove that I'm better than anybody else at investment management. I'm going to do other things where the rewards are going to be more likely and more substantial. Hmm. But it's hard. You know, we're all trained. If you work harder, you'll do better. If you do your homework in school, you'll get higher grades. If you work hard in your initial job, you'll get faster promotions. Uh, everything that we're taught as children and as we learn in experience, if you work harder at something, you're almost sure to do better. And that's very often true. But um, not always. And this is one of those places where you've got other things you should concentrate your energy in. <laughs> So Charlie, we we are already converts to to indexing, as are many of our listeners, and you've already touched on some of the arguments. But for for someone who may not yet be sold on indexing, how would you convince them? Ask them to look at the data. Ask them to look at the causal factors that are causing the data, and ask them to keep a record of their own investing. Mm. Accurate record, and boy, you learn a lot from your own record saying, son of a gun, who would ever have thought that I, good old me, was part of the problem? Huh. That's a, that's a great one. Keep Keeping a record of your own uh, investment decisions is a good one. Is there a type of investor that should not invest in low-cost index funds? I don't know of anyone that I would say should not. Uh, i give you a couple of examples. Most of us who knew him at all had the highest regard for David Swenson, who was the chief investment officer for Yale and turned in one of the truly outstanding records of achievement. And it'd be very hard to make an argument, you know, David Swenson should have been indexing. But he started, when he first took on the responsibility, he had most of the fund in indexing. Hmm. And then gradually found ways that active investing of the kind that he was particularly good at doing could make a justified case for you get an incremental return by not indexing, but by being active. And some of that was portfolio structure. He was the first, not exactly the first, but one of the first to consider hedge funds. He was one of the first to get involved in private equity. He was one of the first to get involved in venture capital. He was one of the first to get involved in creative real estate. Uh, that is a man who was extraordinarily bright, rigorous thinker, very disciplined in everything he did. And he found that there were places he could get a comparative advantage structurally because parts of the market weren't being all that well attended. Big change from then to today. Today, many other institutions are doing hedge funds and private equity and real estate and international and all kinds of other things like that. Now, but at the time, he was able to create quite a significant comparative advantage. The second thing, with all of us who knew David had to stand in awe at his skill, he was awfully good at selecting individual managers. And he had over 100 different investment managers. And if you looked at his list, I promise you, you would not have been able to say, you know, I know 20 names on this list. Most people couldn't come close. Most people would say, I know two or three names, but the rest I've never actually heard of. Right so on. he was constantly working to find really talented investment managers that were doing things that other people weren't thinking about uh, and relatively small in their assets under management compared to their skill set. So put those two together and then stay disciplined, disciplined, disciplined. Oh, and by the way, he was particularly skilled at managing risk, uh, paid more attention to managing risk by a long shot than he did to rate of return. And he had a, a consequential, substantial success. 
I think it's very, very realistic for the largest investment organizations with gifted individuals and a great leader to put together a record of achievement that is actually better than you would be able to achieve through indexing. And I've had the experience of seeing that in the King Abdullah University of Science and Technology, which mm. in the world of education is one of the three or four largest endowments now, started out at $20 billion, it's now comfortably over 40, uh, with a discipline and a skill set that you have to be in awe of. Uh, it's just persistent, wonderful, first rate, careful work. They still do a fair amount of indexing, but where they find a comparative advantage that's large enough to step up, they'll step up. For any individual person, for almost any organization, the chances of being able to develop the information about active managers to be able to make shrewd, profitable choices of active managers are just way too low. And candidly, you've got better things to do in terms of trying to figure out what kind of investing is best for your organization or for you as an individual. And defining the purpose of the investing is for most people where they could really do a lot of good for themselves by being very active about that part of investment management. Hmm. Yeah, I want to I want to dig more into that uh, later. My, my my understanding of the data on institutions that have attempted to replicate the the Swenson Yale model, most of them have not been super successful. Is that correct? That's correct. So even there, it's tough. Well, I majored in art history, so I tend to go back and use that as an analogy. There are a lot of people who are painting pictures, and there are a lot of people who are painting pictures and actually making a reasonable, reasonable living um, at doing it. But there are very few people that are painting pictures that are going to be in the walls of the great art museums mm. 100 years from now. I like that. Swenson as an artist. Very nice. Um, we, we've been talking about index investing in general. I, I want to ask Charlie, what do you think about low cost systematic strategies that seek higher expected returns in the market by owning riskier stocks like small cap value stocks as an example? I have no problem. First, let's say indexing is an implementation strategy. Hmm. And if you don't have a strong opinion, then I think you should seriously consider global index funds and say, basically, I don't have a strong opinion that I'm willing to live with for 10 years or longer. And so I'm going to assume that I'll be wise to go where other people have made the best decision making. So, and I do emphasize global as well as large cap, mid cap, small cap, the full spectrum. If, on the other hand, you know for sure that you have a strong opinion and you want to exercise it, I have no problem with somebody saying, I'm going to be, my one condition is that you're going to do this for a long, long, long time. Not right. that you're going to try it for six months, try it for 12 months, and then go do something else. Because you can screw up indexing easily by jumping from one index to another index to another index because... Uh, you're almost guaranteeing that you'll be making mistakes because you get the same information other people have. It's already priced into the index, the stocks that are in the index. And so uh, you're just making trouble for yourself if you're willing to switch around and around and around. But if you're comfortable with large cap, small cap, your choice, you feel strongly about it, fine. I don't really get upset when somebody says, well, I really rather stay invested in America only. For me, that's fine because it's such a large market and it's such a large economy. And it's got so much diversification and it's so well, um, oper the, the operational skills that are brought to bear all the time are really very, very good. That's fine. You're probably wiser to inter internationalize your investing. Uh, but you know, how people feel is a very important part of the reality. And mm. it's not how they feel today. It's how will they feel when it doesn't look like things are going the right way. 
And it's a little bit like the secret to raising teenage children is to be able to take a long-term view. Uh, if you're going to get upset about what they did or didn't do on a particular day, you're not going to have an easy time being a parent. But if you're able to keep in mind, no, 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 by the time they're 30, they're going to be people I really like a lot, you'll be fine. So instead of trying to time or beat the market, what should investors and their advisors be focused on? Oh, thanks for asking. I think this is really the most important message I could give to anybody. And that is to be an active investor at figuring out who the hell are you? What is your real situation? And I put it to you that almost every investor is different from almost every other investor. People talk about Harvard, Yale, and Princeton as though they're three of the same. They are very, very, very different institutions in terms of what is their investment reality. And when you're managing the endowment for those institutions, what are you actually responsible for accomplishing? So the first and most important thing any of us can do as individuals or as institutions is to figure out what is it about us that's different. And if you use individuals and as you say, playing field for a second, uh, we differ a lot in terms of our age, our ability to save, how much we have saved, our attitude towards uh, gifts to members of our family and inheritance. Uh, we differ in terms of our desires to accumulate for philanthropic purposes. We differ in terms of risk tolerance or comfort. And I mean, short-term risk tolerance and long-term risk tolerance, both. Uh, we differ substantially in how much we enjoy investing and whether we're interested in it or not, are we willing to spend a lot of time trying to figure ourselves out what makes us tick? What's our psychological weakness? What do we have to be protecting ourselves against? All sorts of things like that. When you get all of those together, it's my own personal simple summary. We're all unique. Mm. Each one of us is different. You and I wear eyeglasses, but I'm sure that your prescription for your eyeglasses is a little different <laughs> from mine. Uh, you probably wear different size shoes than I do. Uh, your family <laughs> likes you to wear certain colors more than my family likes me to wear. Uh, uh, one after another, after another, after another differentiation. And we are wonderfully different. It goes down to things like our fingerprints are so different that we can go to prison on the basis of our fingerprints and our DNA, 500 years from now, people can identify who we were and what we did. As Thomas Jefferson's uh, descendants have been um, intrigued to find out that they could genetically prove that ancestry. And, and, you know, if we just have a little bit of reverence and uh, appreciation for the fact that we're all different and then find out what's right for us, and stay focused on what's right for us, I think will be very, very well advanced. Um, the other thing that I'm really keen on is most of us pay absolutely no attention when we're thinking about our investing, think absolutely no attention whatsoever to parts of the total equation that are really important. For example, how many people really know how much is the value of social security that will be paid out to them year after year after year after year. If they went into the marketplace to try to buy it, how much would it cost to get a product equal to social security benefits? And you know, almost nobody knows what the answer is. Well, why not? It's a terribly important part of your economic reality. And what is the difference between your home as, a, um, as an economic entity and your home as a very important part of your family life. It's an economic entity. So if you ever had to, you could sell your home and downsize, or you might decide, hey, the kids have grown up. We really ought to downsize because it's a nuisance trying to take care of this large house and all that sort of stuff. Fine. But being able to look at the total picture of your finances is, in my opinion, very, very important. And if you start with for an example, somebody's 30 years of age and ask, how much should they have in fixed income investments? I look at it and say, gee, why would they have anything in fixed income investments other than a reserve 
of modest means just to cover an, an emergency that might pop up. But look at their, their reality, their future, is that they're going to be able to earn and save for years and years and years. And then they're going to have Social Security on top of that. And maybe they ought to be looking at all equity investment. Right. or nearly all equity investment. And if you say, no, 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 invest your age in bonds at 30, you want 30% invested in bonds? Or at 50, what, 50% invested in bonds? Why? Why? Well, there may be people that for whom it's the right answer, but it's not going to be the right answer for most people. And we'll, if you could find out what makes you particular, you, you could probably do a great job starting from there to build an investment program that's really right for you and your family. I laugh and I give myself as an example. I'm cheerfully 85. Wow. Uh, glad to be here. Uh, no complaints. <laughs> but if you said, well, see, you must have mostly in bonds, aren't you? I said, no, I'm not. I don't own any bonds and I have no intention of owning bonds. You're all in stocks. At your age? Yeah. Why? Why? Well, I'm lucky enough to continue earning a living and with the required minimum distribution, it more than covers our family expenses. And we, we don't live a fancy life, so maybe that makes it easy, but uh, that's covered. So what am I investing for? Well, I'm investing to be sure my wife is comfortable. Fine. But what's her and mine jointly investing program. Well, it's for our kids. Is that it? No, it's for our kids and our grandchildren. And the grandchildren average age is 15. Do they give a damn about what's going on in the stock market today? No. Will they care about what happened in the stock market 10 years from now? No. What they care about yeah. is when they're in their 60s, 70s, and 80s, getting close to this time for spending, they would like to know that there was plenty or ample yeah how important do you think it, it is to have a well-defined investment policy statement uh that's a little bit like how important do you think it is to be honest with yourself about what's going on in life in any other dimension i think if you can't write down on one side of a sheet of paper what you're trying to do and how you're going about it and give it to somebody who's a really smart cookie and a friend of yours who will ask you tough questions and say, you know, it's interesting. We've just asked you every question we can think of and we've pushed and pulled and there isn't a word on this document that we think we ought to change. And, you know, how long would it take you to do that? Maybe a day, more likely an hour and a half. Right. It could be the best, most valuable hour and a half you spent in your entire investment career. And then you ought to go back and look at it every once in a while. Many people recommend once a year, fine. Do it at Thanksgiving so you can be appreciative. Do it at Christmas if you want to. Do it on your birthday if you want to. Do it on the 4th of July as another dimension of independence. Whatever way you want to go. Interesting. But do it on a regular basis. And um, be sure that you're showing your wife or spouse, husband, what you've written down, and be sure that you're quite comfortable sitting with a friend who's a smart, tough cookie, saying, can you see anything in this that I should have changed? What can investors do to protect themselves from themselves? That's a tough one. You know, you should ask a psychiatrist. Uh, I'd love to give you a straight answer, but I think the main thing is study the markets enough so that you realize how skillful the price setting really is and how hard it is for anybody to do better than say, I'll take what's on available. Right. Uh, the second thing would be really try to understand yourself and putting it in writing and showing it to your spouse or a friend can be a very, very good way of getting close enough to being accurate so that you could say, you know, I find that very, very helpful. But you got to recognize as a starting line, all of us are always our own worst enemies. 
it's not because we're mean-spirited people. It's just that we're human beings and we tend to make mistakes. And uh, I think Daniel Kahneman's wonderful book, uh, Thinking Fast and Thinking Slow, is probably the most valuable book for most people to read about investment management because it explains how we do make systematic mistakes and we are going to continue doing it. And it's all in many, many cases been worked out that yes, 85% of people do make this sort of mistake. I guess I'm going to be one of the 85. You, you've been doing this for a long time, Charlie, and you've talked to a lot of people. What do you think is the most underappreciated action that individual investors can take to be more successful? Oh, defining who they really are. Mm. Figuring out what the real problem is. I'm an art history major, but I had friends who were engineers, and they all told me the same thing. Most of engineering is know, learning how to figure out and define the problem. Mm. Solving the problem is not very hard. And most of us, candidly, with regard to investing, have not figured out what is the problem. Hmm. And we just didn't realize, oh, you know, that's really important. That if you could get everybody to sit down and spend even a day trying to figure out what is the problem, you know, they'd probably be, probably be well advantaged. Hmm. One of the problems that you've talked about often our fees, and that's been Vanguard's main message. How well do you think the magnitude of the fee differential between index and active strategies are understood? I'm afraid that's very, very little deep wow. understanding, except those people who have gone through the thought process and they've said, my God, do you realize how much I was actually paying in fees? I don't want to do that anymore. When you, when you hear People say, well, how much do you get charged for investment management? The answer is always, it's, it's small. Yeah, but what's the number? Oh, it's only 1%. And then you say, 1% of what? 1% of the assets. Yeah, but Charlie, those are your assets. What's the manager doing to make things better? Oh, return. Well, what's your expectation of return over the long term? I don't know, six or seven percent looks like a reasonably good bet from here. Okay, let's assume it's seven percent. So one percent of assets is what percent of returns? Oh, about fifteen percent. Wait a minute, fifteen percent is not small. Well, yeah, but you know, we always call it only one percent because that's what we're sort of habitual. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But it's actually it's getting to be pretty large, isn't it? Now wait a minute. Index funds give you the same return of the at seven percent, and they charge you less than one tenth of one percent of the assets. Now, uh, what are active managers doing for you? Well, they're getting a return that's higher than the market. Oh, I see. And what is the fee increment above index fund fees for active management that will get you that higher rate of return? Right. Oh, it's uh, somewhere around 90, 100, 110 basis points. So you're getting a higher rate of return than the market offers through index funds by enough to make that worthwhile? Well, I hadn't thought about it that way. Actually, I don't get as much of a rate of return as I would have in index funds doing active management. You mean you're actually paying a fee that's infinitely larger than the value added of the service that you're getting? Well, come on, that's one way of looking at it. I get a lot of thoughtful attention and I get reports and I know the manager's working very hard all the time on my behalf. That's, that's a nice way of describing it, Charlie, but is it really, really, really true? Or are you, you know, if you, if you go to the cattle farm and ask the cattle, what do you think the deal is here? That's pretty good living. My friends are all here together. We get food anytime we want it. We get um, plenty of water to drink. And uh, we kind of stand around mooing with each other. And that's all there is to it. And um, it's funny how few of the steer would say, and actually we're going to give our lives over to the production of steaks and other things for other people. And you look at 
other situations. I just I was amazed to me, in fact, to look at the reality and then look at the way it's perceived. Um, the perception is you've got brilliantly talented people working hard for you all the time. That's true. The perception is that they're going to be able to make a real difference to your economic situation. That's very unlikely to be true. What's very, very likely to be true is you're going to make a wonderful difference to their economic situation. That's it. Uh, I'm a That's graduate of Yale College and Harvard Business School. And in both cases, I'm so glad that I went to the institutions that I do a fair amount of fundraising for each one. And when I get every five years, it's time to have a reunion. It's time to start making the calls. I go to the list of the people that were in the investment management business and I start there because they've all got lots of money and they all feel quite appreciative of the way the world has worked out for them. And so they've got the right attitude. Oh, what one thing I do do is I wait for an up market day and not call. I don't call people to get a gift when the market is down for the day. I do it when the market is up for the day. Yeah, that's a, uh... The, the active managers absorbing the incremental return that they earn, that's the, that's the key takeaway there. We had, um, we had Jonathan Burke on our podcast. They, he had a paper uh, a, a while ago that theoretically showed that that is exactly what you would expect in equilibrium, that the active managers collect all of the, all of the incremental return in, in fees. Uh, so, Charlie, you, you've been telling this story of index funds consistently for decades. Uh, and and that, that, that's phenomenal. I want to ask, what have you changed your mind about throughout your career of doing that? Well, first of all, when I first got started in the early 1960s, I believed then and I would believe again that it was a great time for active investment management. Mm. It was an absolutely spectacular period of time it gradually shrank and disappeared. But there was a time, just like there was a time when I was 18, 19, and 20 years old, and I could do all kinds of physical things that today, honestly, I wouldn't even consider. Uh, I would swap one for one, but, you know, what the heck. Uh, there, was a, there was a time when it was just wonderful to be an active investment manager just getting started. And of course, indexing wasn't available anywhere in those days at all. So. so you've been around a lot of institutional investors, including sitting on and in fact chairing Yale's investment committee. So in your experience, Charlie, how much respect do institutions and endowments give to low cost index investing? Well, I think the answer is for those who are serious minded, thoughtful and are up to the kinds of responsibility you're talking about, and therefore virtually everybody who's carrying that kind of responsibility, they all would have a very, very high regard for indexing. Those who are particularly well-organized, particularly gifted, and particularly deeply engaged in the networking and uh, scuttlebutt network and trying to learn more and more, do pretty consistently believe that they can, at the top end, add a small incremental advantage that on the base of very large assets they're responsible for makes a great deal of good sense. And therefore, that they should be, and I can understand why they feel that way, active investment managers. But where they are active investment managers is pretty far removed in most cases for the bulk of their assets from where individuals might be going. They are not investing in domestic U.S. stocks as a principal activity. They might have a modest portion in U.S. stocks, but their investing is international. Uh, it very often in exotic kinds of investing, private equity, venture capital, uh, <clears throat> hedge funds, where there is a wide spectrum of returns for those who are very, very good at selecting, carefully choosing the rate of return can be very, very rewarding. For those who are pretty good at that work, the rewards are not very great. For those who are not pretty damn good at it, the rewards are actually a penalty, a negative. And the spectrum of returns for venture capital goes from absolutely wonderful 
to absolutely embarrassing. Mm. Mm. Uh, we talk about the wonderful. We don't talk about the embarrassing. What do you think about efforts to bring those exotic asset classes like private equity and venture capital to retail investors like Vanguard has recently done this? Well, I'd say Vanguard is a unique operation. Uh, Vanguard has done this for institutional investors. You have to have substantial assets before they would even allow you to consider. And their strategy was, as I understand it, our clients are increasingly wanting to be able to make private equity investments. Let's see if we can find a talented, wide spectrum private equity manager that we could relate to the same way we relate to the managers of stocks, bonds, and other outside manager roles. If we could find such an organization that's got a wide diversification in its range of capabilities, has proven that can go through a change in leadership over time because they've had successive generations in leadership and has values comparable to what we at Vanguard hold, and we can negotiate the favorable terms, uh, we'd feel pretty good about that. So that I think is a very carefully done, uh, mm. disciplined selection tr choice, and they don't expect to be in the top quartile. Mm. What they would like to be is in the second quartile with some confidence, uh, and it's only for long-term investors and mm. only substantial investors. So. They've tried to work it out so that uh, they've worked to find a source of supply that is comfortable for the long term, probably won't be one of the very best, probably won't be, oh, my God, you've got to see what I've been able to do, but probably be pretty damn satisfactory results and heavy on the assurance that they've got the right kind of organization mm -hmm. to work with. And best I can tell, and people that I talk to, that seems to be exactly what they've accomplished. Hmm. But it was to fill out a need that they felt their clients had for something that they weren't able to do in the past, and they wanted to have a fuller capability. Hmm. Makes sense the way you explain it. Do, do you view investment management as a profession? Oh, that's that's not a fair question. Uh I think it should be at all times a profession. I think the skills brought to bear are ones that we would most of us put down as those are professional skills. People devote their entire life to doing investment management of a particular kind, have gotten education to be able to do that, are constantly learning and learning and learning in order to be able to do that and do it with a tremendous amount of sincerity and commitment and give it all they've got. So in that sense, very definitely professional. But the reality of the world is that if you said, okay, certain characteristics are professional and other characteristics are commercial, as you look at the blend of characteristics in investment management organizations, which are dominant? And I regret to say that in my own personal experience, the dominance is on the commercial side. And you can tell one clue to that is, well, what's the record of the person who's in charge of the organization? And what's the record of the person who's next in line to be in charge of the organization? And almost always those individuals have been chosen because they are really good at business management. They may have originally started out in the profession, but they've developed over time. Their distinctive competence is they're good at organization management, motivating people, and turning in economic results that are favorable to the owners of the investment organization, i.e. the profits. And they're really good at it, which is why they've got those very difficult jobs. But they are not as focused on the professional disciplines of serving and caring greatly about what's really right for clients because they have to be doing what's really right for the owners because that's their job. Now they blend that with doing what's right for the clients as much as they can 
But if you got right down to the nut cutting, the final choices, most of the time their final choice would be what's really, really in the interest of the owner of the organization. And one example of that is, do they grow larger than they probably ought to? Mm. Well, yes, they do, because incremental assets are extraordinarily rewarding. And the owners really notice that. Where do you see the biggest future opportunities in our field of investment management? Virtually everywhere. Wow. Uh, you know, there's so many different kinds of investment management that people can undertake to do. Uh, there's so many different ways in which they can increase the value of their organization's competence to serve clients and then take it out to clients that are not yet getting that service value. Uh, it's, it's a wonderful field in that sense of being able to go in virtually any direction you want to go uh, if you're skilled enough and diligent enough to make it all come together. And uh, I think each individual has to be careful to choose for themselves because there are so darn many choices. All right. In, in, in your book, you talk briefly about the difference between price discovery and value discovery. I, I'd love it if you could talk about that and maybe also what role do you think financial professionals should play in value discovery? Well, price discovery is getting the correct price. And if you look at anything in economics, <clears throat> the function of markets is to bring willing buyers and willing sellers together at a reasonable cost to themselves to participate in transactions. <clears throat> and the better and better the market, the more and more exactly the price will be the correct price. That is that there's no way you could get a comparative advantage by shopping around or looking for something different. And if you look at investment management as an activity, it has resulted in correct pricing of companies and of various sorts of assets, real estate being an obvious one. Uh, but, you know, every kind of asset is in one way or another being priced in a market. And in the, if you take all the investment assets, the pricing of investment assets around the world has been substantially improved. So not necessarily year after year after year, but decade after decade after decade, for sure. And it has resulted in uh, some very nice benefits to the economics of one country after another, one industry after another. So it's been really a terrific, positive experience. And price discovery has been exceedingly well-developed, uh, partly because we make all sorts of information available to all sorts of investors and encourage them to try to find what is it that they would most like to have so that you have an aggregating process that results in price discovery that is simply superb. If you look at <clears throat> value discovery, the way I think about it, value discovery is for each individual investor and for each institution, what is it that they really, really want to have? as a result of their long-term investment program. <clears throat> and there, I think we've got way big opportunities to do better and better and better by being more careful about defining what is it that we would value if we were to get it and being accurate about that, not whimsical but and short run, but long run, what really is the purpose that we have in mind as to what values we're trying to realize. And I do believe that investment advisors can make a terrific difference in that field and make a wonderful contribution long run to their clients' total experience in investment management. <clears throat> I, I, I completely agree with you. And I find it to be uh, uh, unbelievable that you wrote about that in your book when you did, because that's uh, you, you were thinking way ahead of your time, I would say. Nice of you to say. <laughs> I wouldn't have said it that way. I just said, you know, I put it down on paper. I'm sure a lot of other people were thinking about it at the same time. And I probably would have gotten it from several other people and then sort of said, yeah, you know, they're all saying the right sort of thing. I'm going to write that down. Huh. So while we're complimenting you here, Charlie, I must say what I find so fascinating about your work is 
you're at the cross section of looking at and understanding companies and businesses, as well as your prolific career in, in the asset management business. And, and specific examples, your excellent book, Capital, as well as What It Takes, are two phenomenal books about companies. So with that as a setup, what do you think has made Vanguard so successful as a company? Well, it's a, an interesting combination. Uh, first of all, some of it is good luck. Some of it is extraordinary guts. Blended in with anger and determination uh, in a way that you look back on and say, thank goodness that all came together. Some of it is a opportunity that almost all of us would like to have, and that's to be part of an organization that really is devoted to serving clients and has a clear vision of how to go about serving clients that works, works for us as an organization and works for the clients that we'd like to serve. And then develop a culture internally that allows people to feel deeply committed to that mission or purpose. Um, and then the leadership that allows the organization to get better and better and better at what it's trying to do. And all of those things have come together in Vanguard. I mean, it's easy to forget today that when Jack Bogle first got going at Vanguard, <clears throat> he had almost nothing. His mission was to be the administrative back office for a group of mutual funds that were actually losing assets year after year after year. <clears throat> Jack never loved the back office work. He was really good at sales and he cared a lot about creativity, strategic moves, and he was extraordinarily gifted at innovation. But Jack never loved what was the total job of Vanguard. So he got going pretty quickly. Then he got lucky. Money market funds came available. And Jack realized, my God, Vanguard could do a money market fund, not at 1% of assets, but at a fraction of that. And we, if we got bigger, we could make the fraction smaller and smaller and smaller. So money market funds just happened to come at the right time. And he grabbed hold of it and ran with it. That led to bond management. And once again, if you're in the bond management business, bonds are bonds are bonds. And a really good bond manager won't differ very much from another really good bond manager in rate of return. But if the fees are different, everybody looks at it and you can't deny it. It's in black and white. It's there right in front of your very eyes. So you can't miss it. And then John Neff, who many people don't know about today, but in John's time, in the 35 years that he was an active manager of the Windsor Fund, John turned in the best record of any investment manager that was in a mutual fund organization. And he did it in terms of rate of return, but what the, the sort of special extra was, he also did it by risk management the whole way through. So he had the lowest risk level and the highest rate of return, and not every year, but over every five-year period, and it just table thump, table thump, table thump, turned in wonderful investment results, and that attracted a lot of attention. In and around the financial community, people said, hey, look, you get NEF, and it's a terrific value, and the fees are low. If, you got index, if you're going to have any money market fund, for God's sake, go to Vanguard. If you're going to have bond management, for goodness sake, go to Vanguard. So all of a sudden, there are three different ways in which Vanguard had a really significant differentiation in what it was able to offer. And people started talking about it, talking about it, talking about it. And that really is what lifted off Vanguard as an organization. But don't forget, Jack Bogle was still a driven man trying to strive and find a way to be stronger, better, whatever. And he was gifted at finding ways that would leave other people saying, Jack, are you sure that's a good idea? 
Well, by the time he'd done all his homework, he was pretty damn sure he was on the right track. He wasn't a perfect human being by any stretch. And I think uh, the reputation that he accumulated over time was partly Jack Bogle's greatest uh, development or invention because uh, he created an image and reputation for who he was that was absolutely wonderful. It wasn't necessarily always true, but, you know, it's still pretty inspirational. Yeah, and your book Inside Vanguard does a great job of of telling that incredible story. So when you look at, like, some of the words you use to describe Vanguard, determination, guts, anger, these are powerful, energizing words. Are, are themes like this consistent with other successful businesses that you have studied? I think almost every organization that gets started in that starting period, that's exactly what it's all about. Um, almost every entrepreneur, every entrepreneur that I know is motivated in early stages in part by anger, in part by self-confidence, in part by a dream of what they would be able to do if they ever get their chance and they're determined they're going to see if they can make that happen. And it's a, it's a wonderful reality. And um, I think it, it, the, the amount of energy and determination that has to be brought to bear, uh, like a coil spring, to do something as entrepreneurial successful uh, it's really something else. And uh, if you don't have that absolute ferocious determination, and I hope it won't upset people to realize, and often it's anger, often mm. it's I'll show those guys, or I'll show that guy, or I'll show my dad, or I'll show the world. There's, some of that is I'm going to prove that I can do what I'm going to do. Now, if you don't have that fire in the belly, you're very likely not to have the drive to go through the rough and tumble of getting something pulled together and started up and up over the hill and starting to really make an impact. Uh, it's, it's a great thing about this country, in my opinion, is there are very large numbers of people who have got that determination to be successful. But it won't be just, I would like to be successful. That's very, very nice. Mm. But you've got to have some driving force that will take you through the cold, dark, winter days when you're still struggling and trying to raise the money, trying to get the clients, trying to get the people to join with you. There's a lot that goes into getting a company up and going. But if you've got that drive, this is a great country in terms of receptivity to new ideas, new people, new organizations. And we actually, as a nation, we celebrate the new, new thing. It's terrific. Hmm. Charlie, you, you have had an incredibly productive career of thought leadership, writing, speaking, and I'm, I'm sure many other, many other things behind the scenes. What have you learned about personal motivation and productivity throughout your career? Gee, that's a tough question. Uh, if, particularly when you start with what I've just been saying. <laughs> uh, it, it, it's a interesting combination of different factors at different stages. One is it really matters to have a good idea of how you could mm. add value or be of real value to other people. Mm. It does help if you're in a nation where there are a fairly large number of those other people. Uh, it helps if you have had an experience working in an organization that gave you an opportunity to see good skills and also lack of skills mixed together and to realize, you know, if I could stop doing some of the things that that other guy was doing and just concentrate on doing the good things, I think that would make a nice difference. Uh, as I said before, it, you got to have a terrific amount of determination. And uh, some of that determination is with yourself. Some of it is with your family. And some of it is with your friends. Uh, and you've got to be willing to share the positives in a very generous way with other people so that they can say, no, no, it's not it's Jack's firm or John's firm. It's our firm, and we're really doing it together. And when you get to that stage, then I go back to uh, 
You need to have a culture that is centered on serving clients because everybody would like to do a good job that's really worthwhile. And boy, does that make a nice difference when you've got a high motivation. We're here to do something we're proud of. Hmm. Big, big difference. Uh, the second thing is to recruit rigorously and carefully and really make that a high priority. And the very best organizations have all made recruiting the very best people their first most important priority hmm. because they know darn well that the firm they're going to be in 10 years is the firm that is composed of the people they recruit now. So it's very, very standard procedure, but not very often done and implemented. Hmm. And then if you've got a organization that's innovative, then some of the innovations will be unique to a specific situation. Some will be innovations that you can use several different times. Some will be innovations that you can use many, many, many times. And then some will be innovations of the way in which you change your organization to be responsive to opportunities and challenges as you go along the way. Uh, all with a long-term focus on building the organization through the right people to serve the right people in a systematic way. And um, it's awfully easy to say out loud, but all of these things are absolutely essential. And one of those essentials is leadership. And the job of leadership is to be sure all the different component parts are being brought together all the time and kept at their highest level of uh, value adding contribution to the total picture. Mm -hmm. Our final it's question. also one of the greatest ways you spend time. If you're going to have a career, why not do something like that? It's just full of privileged opportunities to do something that you can be terribly proud of. Hmm. Our final question for you, Charlie. How do you define success in your life? Oh, I think that's, that's a cute uh, way of describing it. It's Basically, it's being deeply pleased with the way things worked out. That you can look back on your life and say, you know, or your career and say, <clears throat> I've enjoyed what I did. I was challenged to my best levels of capability. I didn't get out of my own skill set. So I was never out there. Mm. Uh, doing something that might have been at risk for other people or for myself or for my organization. Uh, learned a lot along the way and developed a great many friendships with the people that I was serving as well as the people that I was competing with. And if you could put all those together, uh, I think you'd find yourself feeling very deeply satisfied as to what you have. Uh, finding a purpose in life or a personal or private mission, and then being able to bring it into reality and enjoy it along the way and enjoy the privileges of really great friendship with wonderful people who know what you're doing and why you're doing it and hold respect for it. That's a, to me, that would be the total picture. Hmm. Notice that I did not say, and it was well rewarded financially, because I don't think the financial rewards are anywhere near as important as the spiritual or personal or emotional rewards that go with knowing you did something that you wanted to do, that your clients or friends really wanted you to do, and that you did in a way that they were all feeling pretty damn good about it. Wow. Well, I must say, Charlie, this has been a, a uh, one of my career highlights to meet you and get a chance to talk with you. So thank you so much for joining us. Well, Cameron, how you know I've had a wonderful experience. Thank you very much for the invitation. Thanks, Charlie. I, I, I'm telling you, man, that the thing in your book when I read that, because you wrote that a long time ago, and it's like, it seems to me at least that it's relatively recently that the the field of financial advice is starting to focus more on helping people live good lives as opposed to generating the best possible rate of return. And uh, to read those words written so long ago, it was just like, wow, mind-blowing, amazing. Well, you're very, very generous, and I love hearing it. But <laughs> <laughs> uh, be careful.
And I, I'd know, also, if you said, you know, what what really has contributed to your things working out so well for you? It's one four letter word that comes immediately to mind over and 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 over, and over again. It's luck. Yeah. Uh, just, just incredibly lucky break to be an American, to be in this era uh, that you look back over the last 50, 75 years. What a wonderful time. Getting good education was sort of a normal thing. Yeah, but jeepers, creepers, wasn't it terrific? Yeah, you're darn right. And then <clears throat> to get into the investment management business just as it was getting started mm -hmm. and to realize it's going to be a global business. It's just an unbelievable privilege. Hmm. Yeah, unreal.